So in my first video about ISS replacements, we covered Orbital Reef in a great deal of detail, including a lot of information about the various companies that are most probably going to be involved in its construction and operation. Orbital Reef is without question going to be an international space station, every bit as international as the ISS, with the exception of of no Russian involvement, which I find to be very unfortunate, but unfortunately necessary. However, that having been said, it's going to take a minimum of five years to get this damn thing deployed. Is there anything that we have in the works that's going to be in space and operational faster? Well, the answer is a conditional yes. As most of us know, a few years ago, NASA put out a bid for a space station that would be built off of the ISS, that is to say, use the ISS's life support systems, its electrical systems, etc., in order to keep it running until it was prepared to become a free-flying station. This station, of course, is the Axiom Space Station, and the very first mission to support this station is going to be happening on March 30th, Yes, just a couple of weeks away, and that's part of an overall plan on the part of Axiom Space to raise capital for this station while also demonstrating the type of extremely important work that can be carried out in microgravity without having their own space station in orbit. It's a very unique concept, a very unique way to raise funds, and they have already secured some very wealthy backers. However, to everybody's great surprise, the whole concept of building a space station off of the ISS and relying on this station's life support and other systems while you're constructing a station has now become a very shaky prospect, simply because Dmitry Rogozin and his friends at Roscosmos are routinely threatening the future of the ISS. As a matter of fact, I'm very impressed that Axiom Space is sending their first mission up to the ISS in spite of the current political crisis that's going on. But here's the question. Is this going to work? How rapidly can Axiom get this station completed? And will they be able to finish the job before it's too late? In just over two weeks from the release of this video, a monumental event in the history of spaceflight is going to take place. The first commercial crew mass mission, rather, all the way to the ISS. Yes, the Inspiration mission was also entirely private, but this mission is going to the ISS, and it's going for a sustained amount of time in order to carry out a variety of different extremely important types of experiments that can only be carried out in microgravity. The name of each crew member is important too, simply because they all represent different countries. Commander Michael Lopez Alegria, for example, represents both the United States and Spain. Pilot Larry Connor represents the United States. Mission Specialist Mark Pathy represents Canada. And Mission Specialist Etienne 
Sion Stibbe, and I believe I pronounced that right, represents Israel. The importance of this mission is not simply to send four wealthy philanthropists from various different countries up to space in order to raise money for some sort of charity, although I think that's a very good idea. These men intend to carry out some very important experiments for medical institutions in their respective countries. Larry Connor, for example, is going to be carrying out a variety of experiments for the Mayo Clinic. He's going to be acting as a human guinea pig, actually, as will his fellow space flyers for various experiments that the Mayo Clinic want to carry out in microgravity. All sorts of potential breakthroughs can be made on research done on a space station, which is exactly what this crew is trying to prove. Etienne Stiebe, for his part, is going to be an insanely busy individual. 35 experiments on behalf of various Israeli institutions. And I'm going to cover most of these in depth to give you an idea of everything that can be done in space. First of all, there's a device called the CRISPR, which is a genetic diagnosis system that enables genetic detection of diseases to identify pathogens that may cause astronauts to fall ill. There's something called space travel that uses T cells in space to examine the physiological responses seen when the human body is exposed to such extreme conditions. Human BBB in space attempts to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. Urinalysis in space, an Israeli medical device startup that delivers home urinalysis and digitized wound care. The impact of space travel on on the urinary biodome. Dome. I mean, it's insane how many different things are being studied here. Remote evaluation of emotional distress. Extrodes, which will conduct a second experiment to remotely analyze emotional stress by studying astronauts' flight patterns. Stroke Alert Limited will conduct a second experiment to remotely detect strokes using a sensor equipped with a machine learning tools with to monitor astronauts before, during, and following following return from their mission. The VEI device will enable blood tests to be performed without a needle. Evaluation of visual functions in spaceflight will examine changes in visual function during spaceflight, given the fact that astronauts have suffered partial loss of vision after long exposures to microgravity. By the way, that's 10 out of 35, and since I don't have an hour-long video here, I'm not going to cover them all. But this is to give you an example of just how many things these men intend to accomplish in low Earth orbit that can only be accomplished in microgravity. Now, you would think that a wealthy businessman would not subject himself to experiments that have to do with pain and pain regulation, but that is exactly what Mark Pathy from Montreal is going to be doing. The experiments he's going to undergo will measure everything from pain linked to bone tissue breakdown to astronauts' immune system in relation to the role of systematic inflammation in acute and chronic pain. He will undergo a battery of baseline medical tests before launch and after splashdown, including magnetic resonance imaging and other scans, as well as completing questionnaires and blood and urine samples at the space station. So this guy is essentially going to go through a great deal of pain and inconvenience in order to make sure that future astronauts don't have to endure as much inconvenience. Quite a sacrifice for somebody who's spending $55 million to go to the ISS. And then finally, there's Michael Lopez Alegria, who has admittedly flown to space four times for NASA. He commanded ISS Expedition 14. However, he now works for Axiom, offering a pathway to space, and he also leads the company's human spaceflight development efforts. These four men are going to demonstrate what is possible on a space station, all of the things that can be done to benefit 
mankind as Axiom slowly builds a space station off of the ISS, using it as a platform until eventually it becomes a free-flying station. Let me explain the process. A series of four private missions will be sent to the ISS, AX-1 through AX-4. The second mission, by the way, is going to be commanded by veteran astronaut Peggy Whitson. And these missions are going to do essentially what AX-1 does, demonstrate the types of work that can be done on a space station while the Axiom station modules are in construction. Then, two years from now, the first of these modules modules are going to be deployed and attached to the ISS. Now incidentally, all four of the previous missions will be pulling a profit for the Axiom company to begin with, and on top of that they're going to be acquiring a great deal of private funding. They've already accumulated over $150 million worth of private investment, and NASA theoretically has given them roughly the same amount of money, although Congress of course has not given them this money, but we'll skip over that for the moment. The the first module, as you can see being deployed here, is Axiom Hub 1. This is reserved for crew quarters, research, and manufacturing. It's actually capable of handling four crew members, and it can operate on its own. In other words, missions will be able to be deployed to Axiom Hub 1 immediately once it's operational, earning money for Axiom before the station is even complete. And guess what? Axiom already has a customer for this first module, and they're called Spacelink. No, not Starlink, Spacelink. And these guys are going to be providing real-time, constant communication from the ISS to their ground station at Cape Canaveral or wherever they wish to communicate at a speed of 10 gigs per second through their network of satellites. That's a pretty impressive speed, and by the way, this is is not an American company, this is an Australian company, and it is something to pay attention to. This organization certainly is not going to be a full-fledged competitor for Starlink. Their intention is not to provide internet service across the planet to every user, but instead provide extremely high-speed communications through their relay system across the planet 24 hours a day so that the orbital pattern of something in LEO doesn't take it out of communications range. This is a problem experienced by lots of spacecraft that are in orbit, but with this network established by this Australian company working in conjunction with Axiom, they intend to solve this problem. Now granted, the NASA Deep Space Network also takes care of these issues, but it relies on satellite transmitters, some of which are located in countries that are no longer friendly to the United States. Plus, the Deep Space Network is incredibly expensive, whereas the Star, the uh, not the Starlink rather, but the Spacelink constellation, and I'm going to make that mistake a hell of a lot, can provide the same type of 24-hour communication communication at a ridiculously high data speed for a much lower price. And they can do this in conjunction with Axiom, and this is going to help them fund their station. Axiom is very wisely not relying on NASA to help them construct this new station. So this very first module, which will be deployed in 2024, will have the ability to conduct experiments, zero-g manufacturing, and space for four crew, each of whom will have their own viewport out onto space in the Earth below. That is a far cry from what the ISS astronauts have to deal with currently. So after that, of course, the second module is going to be deployed. The second module is just simply going to be an expansion on to the first with an additional four crew members. So we're talking eight crew members already on this station and it isn't even close to being completed yet. 
It's also important to note that each module has four docking ports, so with just two modules attached to the ISS, we've added an additional eight docking ports for visiting spacecraft. This is actually far superior to Orbital Reef or the ISS. Axiom has made their station very open to any sort of visitors. And by the way, the reason I'm including SpaceX as a partner in all of this is because because SpaceX is handling AX-1 through AX-4 and most probably will be deploying all the modules as well. Now the third module to be added, and by the way the station has its own canadarm as well, is going to be a dedicated laboratory. And there are so many different things that you can do in microgravity in terms of research and manufacturing. For example, regenerative medicine like stem cells and 3D bioprinting, accelerated disease modeling to affect aging and muscle atrophy, bone osteoporosis, microphysiological systems, pharmaceutical R&D, including drugs in development, and to get FDA approved drugs approved faster. And then finally, physical sciences such as material science, fluid physics, combustion science, so many applications that can be carried out in microgravity that cannot be carried out nearly as easily here on Earth. And you've probably noticed that massive transparent environment at the bottom of the second module. Well, that's actually going to be used as a 3D microgravity hot tub is what I like to call it. An environment where visitors will be able to experience space in all of its magnificence far more effectively than any viewport that's been created for any space station in the past. This of course is for space tourism, but anybody working on the station will be able to take advantage of this, making a stay on the Axiom station far more pleasant and far easier for long duration missions. And then comes the final and most important module of the station, the Power Tower. Now, this module serves all kinds of purposes. First of all, it has solar panels, cutting edge stuff that's going to be able to generate an equivalent amount of power as all of the massive solar panels on the ISS. On top of that, it's going to include life support capability, an airlock for EVAs, and additional storage space. Once the power tower is deployed, the station is complete and ready to detach from the ISS. At that point, we will have a brand new station in orbit, hopefully to accompany Orbital Reef and to compete with it, and also, of course, with the Chinese space station. But I can hear you saying, wait a minute, you lying clickbaiter, you. What about the artificial gravity aspect? Well, some time ago, I interviewed the engineers who are designing this thing, and artificial gravity is definitely on their radar. What they want to do is to establish this station as an operational core that's going to pull in the money, because you can't do any effective research in space unless you're doing it in microgravity. However, for habitation, this station is also capable of being expanded into a rotating ring. As you can see, this station is completely modular. As a matter of fact, each one of the modules is covered in docking ports, which means the central microgravity core could be attached to a rotating ring of habitation centers or habitation modules rather that are kept in artificial gravity. This is the long-term ambition for Axiom, but they can't do anything like this until they're pulling in a substantial amount of revenue. And that revenue is going to come from microgravity research and microgravity manufacturing, which cannot be done in artificial gravity. And that's something I really wish that people who advocate for artificial gravity would understand. Artificial gravity is really only good for long distance transportation and space tourism, not for the effective scientific work that you can do in space.
And fortunately, Axiom is not restricting their work to just a bunch of CGI images. They are currently at work making their first module through Talis Elenia, an organization out of Italy who manufactured a lot of the stuff for the ISS, another aspect that makes this an international space station. So when it comes right down to it, Axiom Space has a very viable, very effective plan for for starting a new ISS that will grow and grow as the need grows. They have the financial capability to get it started and it's going to start earning money right off the bat. They don't have to wait until the entire station is completed as Orbital Reef does before they can start realizing revenue. They have quite a few international investors. They don't need NASA to complete this thing as I've said before and and guess what? They're also making their own spacesuits for their own EVAs, as you may have noticed in that video. So you're looking at a company that may not only be able to solve NASA's ISS problems, it may be able to solve Artemis's spacesuit problems as well. And as you can also see, these modules are completely integratable with the ISS's modules, which means that it will rely on the ISS's electrical systems and life support systems while it's being constructed. And as you may also notice, it has crew dragons attached at just about every port, indicating that SpaceX is going to be a very strong collaborator in the construction of this station, whereas Orbital Reef is going to be a strong competitor. I think that that's going to make things very, very interesting for the future of LEO. And the international characteristics of this station are not just restricted to Tala Selenia. In addition, the very small but extremely wealthy nation of Monaco wants to become relevant as far as spaceflight is concerned. As a result, they are funding private space station travel to the new station as well. And they're also going to be funding astronaut training programs. And Axiom is going going to be able to provide those as well. And this is hardly surprising because Axiom CEO Michael Suffredini served with NASA for 30 years and he was in charge of the International Space Station from 2005 until 2015. This guy has a hell of a lot of experience when it comes to space stations and a lot of his staff have a hell of a lot of experience as being astronauts. This station, in my opinion, has a tremendous amount of potential. It's going to be extremely competitive. It's going to be a very worthwhile and viable solution to our ISS problem, but here's its most serious drawback. It relies on the ISS for support in terms of life support and electricity until it is completed. Until that time, the ISS is going to be necessary to keep keep it running. And if the Russians do anything to sabotage ISS, then Axiom Space's project is also sabotaged. Although everything seems stable on the ISS at the moment, for all we know, the AX-1 crew on March 30th may be wandering into a political hornet's nest on the ISS, and the fact that they're willing to do this is courageous in my opinion. They are willing to sacrifice not only comfort, not only time, but also their lives in many respects in order to better the human race. And really, isn't that what space exploration is all about? If you like what I have to say, if you enjoy this content, then please consider supporting me. There's a number of ways to do so in the description or simply subscribe to my channel and I will be very happy. So until we do have a viable replacement for ISS and we are no longer dependent on the Russians who unfortunately have become extremely unreliable as of late, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.